Welcome to part two of the story of Rabbi Natsan Finkel, the altar of Slabatka and the Musser ideology. This podcast is sponsored by Josh Blackman in honor of his parents, Iris Hershenson and Jamie Blackman. So in part one, we discussed the persona, the personality of Rabbi Natsan Finkel and the framework of the yeshiva that he built, Knesset Yisrael, in Slabatka. In part two, I want to discuss his educational philosophy, how he interacted with students, what was he trying to impart in his students, what is this, beyond the schedule of the Musr Yeshiva, what was the theory of the Yeshiva, what was he trying to do? And I want to suggest, to try to understand his pedagogical philosophy, to look at the preface that Rabbi Nassim Zvifinkel wrote, naturally, of course, he wrote it anonymously, a preface for the book Tomer Devorah. Tomer Devorah is, a, is, a, is an ancient, not ancient, but it's a, it's, a, it's a book that was written several hundred years ago. And in several old publications of this book, there is a preface written by the altar of Slabotka. And like his talks, the preface is dense. It's written haltingly. He doesn't spell out the ideas of what he's trying to say. But I think in this short preface, he provides his perspective of what the end goal of educating students, and indeed, what is the end, not just educating students, but educating anyone in the ways of Torah and Muslim. I want to paraphrase what he says over here. He begins with the Talmud in the book of Brachos. The Talmud quotes the verse in Deuteronomy. The verse says, Moshe tells the Jewish people, the Atta Yisrael, and now, O Israel, Ma Hashem Elokech What does Hashem your God want from you? Kiim Liira, only to fear God. So it seems to imply that what does God want from us? Only to fear Him. They have to fear heaven. And that's, it's not so hard. And the Talmud says, well, is it not so hard? Is fear of heaven not really easy? And the Gemara says, yes, it, it is easy. And it gives an example. It says, suppose you have a person and you ask him for a big barrel. And he has a big barrel. Can I borrow a big barrel? He happens to have one in his garage. And can I borrow it? Sure, it's no problem. It's, it's very easy. If you have the barrel, it's easy. Whereas if you ask his neighbor, I want to borrow a small jug or a thimble, but he doesn't have it, then might as well be a barrel, the, the, a vat. It's easy if you have it. It's hard if you don't have it. That's what the Talmud says. And Rabbi Nassim C. Finkel explains what's going on here. What does this mean? That fear of heaven, fear of God, if you have it, you have it. If you don't have it, you don't have it. And he explains that we believe that God knows the actions of man, knows what we think about, and knows how we behave. And for everything, we're going to be judged for it. And we're going to be punished if we act in a way that God's not happy with. And the punishment is severe. And he gives an example. He quotes the Talmud. The Talmud says that the fire of Gehenim, the fire of hell, is 60 times hotter than our fires that we have today. And we also believe that the judgment is pending. We don't know when we're going to die. We don't know when we are going to face divine retribution, divine judgment. And says the altar of Slavat, if you ask a person if they believe it, and if they're a believer, they'll say yes. Wait a minute. Even animals, they flee from danger. If you have a, a horse, you give it, you, you hit it, it starts running. The ox pulls the plow because he knows if he doesn't, he's going to be whipped. So even animals have the intellect to know to avoid pain and to avoid danger. And yet somehow, we, humanity, 
even though we know that there's danger of going against the will of God, we are not fearful of it. How is that possible? And he explains, if we really believed in God, if our faith in all those precepts was strong, then fearing God would be easy. For Moshe, Moshe really believed all those things, and therefore it wasn't hard for him to abstain from what God says not to do, because, well, who's gonna do who is going to stick their finger into the fire? You know, you know how dangerous it is. Therefore, what he suggests, and this is the point that I want to get to, that really the work that we need to do is to align what we believe intellectually with how we behave instinctually, to make what we know, what we readily admit is true, to make that tangible, to make that palpable, and to make that real, to take the ideology of our brain, of our head, of our faith, and to integrate that into our consciousness. The objective of Torah is to take what we know in our brain, and to integrate that, to have that permeate into our behavior. And he says that's what Musr is. Musr is to bridge the gap with what we already know or what we already believe, but we don't believe strongly enough for it to be considered fear of God. It's not as visceral and as tangible and as real to us as every other danger. And then he tells you, there's many different ways to get to this end. So we have a definition of Musr. The definition of Musr is to bridge the gap between our intellectual knowledge and our instinctual behavior. And the way you do that, the way you integrate that, it depends. Because every person is different, every place is different, and every time is different. And he breaks it down at different kinds of people. You have some people who they need to be broken down and rebuilt together. And you have to talk about how dangerous it is and how the punishments are so severe. And when he thinks about it, when he ruminates on that, then that will bring him along the path. And then you have another person that if you tell him those things, well, they'll just get depressed. And they'll just get sad. And they'll get mopey. And for such a person... You have to uplift them and you have to talk about how great they are and how powerful their soul is and the spiritual world, how grand it is and how impactful their actions are and how their soul is greater than angels and the soul is close to God and kind of uplifting them. And then you have other people who they need to, they just need to be taught in an organized way what they need to do and how they need to do it. And he just points out there's so many different ways of interacting with people. And then there's social factors because some people have different societies and different social pressures and different times. Some people are doing really well. Some people are doing very, very poorly. And some people are depressed. The bottom line is you have to know the person that you're trying to influence. And once you understand exactly who they are and what's operating within them, then you can know which buttons to push. That's what he writes here in his preface to the Tomer Devorah. And I think that if you look at how he behaved with his students, he actually employed this philosophy. He gained first a deep understanding of the character of each student. He knew exactly how to push the right buttons and motivate them and how to galvanize them, each according to their way. And it's actually stunning how divergent his approach was from one student to another. Some of them, he would level them with harsh, biting criticism because he recognized that this is the way to unleash their abilities. Uh, the story goes about Rabbi Yitzchak Hutner, who later on became the Rosh Hashiva of Rabbi Chaim Berlin, one of the great Rosh Hashivas in America. He was a young student in Slabatka, and he already knew all of Talmud. And it was Yom Kippur. And he called him up. He sent a messenger messenger to him. 
and says, I want you to speak to him while everyone's praying. And he started screaming at him in the middle of Yom Kippur in front of everyone. And Rav Hutner said that he knows why he did it. And he, and he took the lesson and it helped him change. There was another, another time, another episode where the altar, he told uh, the Gabbai, he told the person in charge, I want to read from the Torah, the end of Deuteronomy, uh, every Monday and Thursday they read the, the, from the Torah, and I want you to give an aliyah. I want you to have this and this person to read, to, to, to recite the blessing, to get the aliyah. And it was the verses, is Am Naval Velochacham, the verses describing Moshe talking about the Jewish people, that they're a vile and unwise person. And he starts reading it, Am Naval Velochacham, and he looks at that person as if he's directing the person who is, who's right next to him. This is a, a vile and unwise person. And we're told that he would call some of his students Rishayim, evil people. And he would tell him, you're, you're, you're an Amaritz, you're a boar. Once there was a time where a student walked into his room and he took the flame of his lamp and he lowered it. And they asked him, well, why are you lowering the, the light? And he explained, you're not allowed to look at the face of a Russia. You're not, look, not allowed to look at the face of a wicked person. It's to us, you know, my grandfather said that if you would employ this kind of treatment to students today, they'd all escape. But those students that he deemed would flourish more with harsh critique, he would employ it to teach them a lesson. And sometimes even years after the event that triggered the criticism, he would use this form of education to teach a lesson. The story goes that the altar would decide which, on Shabbos, which, you know, on Shabbos we read the Torah, and there's seven people called to the Torah. And there's a hierarchy of what is a more prestigious aliyah and what's a less prestigious aliyah. And moreover, so the third aliyah is the most prestigious, and the fifth is the least prestigious. But also, if the third is a great Torah scholar, then the fifth is the fifth of that particular week is not that bad. Whereas if there's a lightweight being called for the Aliyah of number three, then the Aliyah number five, he knows he's being criticized. So the story goes, someone, a student of, of Slabotka, he was called to the fifth Aliyah, to the weakest Aliyah, after someone who wasn't exactly a heavyweight was called to the third aliyah. So right away, right after they finished praying, right after davening, he went up to the altar and he asked them, what did I do to get this mistreatment? And the altar responded to him, you expect honor? You, someone who seeks to honor himself by shaming his friend, you want to be recognized? You're a miscabed patron chavero. You're someone who gets honor when someone else gets ashamed. So the student says, what are you talking about? When did I ever exhibit this characteristic of trying to glean honor at someone else's expense? So the author tells him that 10 years earlier, there was another student in the yeshiva who walked in to shul, to the, to the, to the base medrash, to the, to the study hall, on Shabbos. And we know on Shabbos, you don't wear tefillin while you pray. But this student, he was a little bit absent-minded, he was preoccupied, and he started pulling off the jacket, the sleeve of his jacket, of his left arm, on Shabbos, as if he's about to put on tefillin. So the altar told this other student to go and to remind him that it's Shabbos. And he went. But the altar noticed that there was a little bit of a sneer, a little bit of a snicker, a little smirk that look at this guy, look at this klutz who is putting on, trying to put tefillin on on Shabbos. And therefore, 10 years later, he reminded him 
that there's some aspect of his character that probably needs to be addressed if he's going to be refined and be perfect. Again, the goal of the Mus- of Musser is to make someone perfect. To make someone perfect, you have to acknowledge that they're not perfect yet. And if you really want to achieve that refinement, that perfection, then you would be very happy to be around such an expert like the altar who would be able to point out for you where you need to work on. But this was his approach with some students. Some students he would always over-index on the criticism. And I want to maybe suggest a rationale, his rationale for this behavior. Uh, again, with another one of a uh, Dvar Torah that he says, the Talmud tells us that if someone wants to purify themselves, then from heaven, they'll help him. Whereas if someone wants to make themselves impure, then from heaven, they will allow him to become impure. That's what the Talmud says. Basically, everyone could choose for themselves which path you want. You want to be pure? You want to be holy? They'll help you. If you want to be impure, you want to be unholy, they'll help you from heaven as well. And the question that the altar asked, wait a minute. We know the Almighty loves us like a father. And the Almighty seeks our betterment. If the Almighty is seeking our betterment, how does it help us where someone is wants to become impure, and the Almighty facilitates that. And the answers is that, indeed, when the Almighty helps someone sin, when the Almighty helps someone descend to the abyss of impurity, that actually helps them spring back. There's, There's two ways to get to the destination. When you reach rock bottom, Ironically, that sometimes could spur you to re-examine your ways and to make amends and to get your life in order. So I think what he's teaching here is, is that there's multiple ways to inspire future growth. Some students, he understood their character and he realized that this would be the best way to do it. And there was other students that he understood would be better off with praise and he would lavish them with titles and honorifics and plaudits and laud their every minor accomplishment. He would tell some students, you will be like Rabbi Kiva Eger, who was the greatest, one of the greatest Talmudic scholars of all time. You'll be like the Shagas Arya, ditto. You're destined to become the Rashka Bahad. You'll be the greatest rabbi of the whole Jewish nation. Uh, there was one student a prize student who was repeating some Haskalic ideas that he heard from his sister at the altar. He would visit him and he would give him effusive compliments. How well you're doing, how proud he is of it. Not a single word of criticism. And post facto, some uh, people have suggested that had the altar been harsh with this particular student, who went on to found one of the greatest yeshivas in the world, it's very likely this student would have abandoned and followed his sister down the path of Haskalah. It's interesting, uh, we said in the last episode, that in 1905, in that uh, around 1905, there was this rise in socialism and Zionism amongst the rank of the yeshiva students. And the altar actually shifted his approach. No longer would he dwell so heavily on the negative side of how much you need to fix and how imperfect you are and how corrupt you are and how you need to fix and and uproot all the evil within you. He he, He stopped that and would start looking at the positive side. He would highlight the unlimited potential of person. He developed a philosophy known as Gadlut HaAdam, Godless HaAdam, the greatness of man. He would always talk about Adam before Adam sinned. What can man become? What could man achieve? Man could be greater than angels. Adam was like that prior and we could still access that today. He would talk about the loftiness of the soul 
and how we can tap into our inner angel. And if we do that, the sky is the limit of what we could become. There is traditions that Elijah, Elijah the prophet, he became an angel after he died. And he can visit with Sadiqim. And it's one of these high levels of achievement that someone could achieve if Elijah the prophet comes to visit them. And once Rav Hutner was sitting with the altar of Slabatka, and he tells him, Our soul, our neshama is greater than angels according to Jewish sources. So if someone has a revelation of self, a revelation of their soul, that revelation is greater than a revelation of Elijah. And the goal of his yeshiva, the goal of Slabatka, was to produce Torah giants in the way of Musr. You know, today, Baruch Hashem, thank God, there's many, many, many yeshivas, many more than there were 100 years ago. But arguably, you could say that the goal of the yeshiva today is much more limited. It's to make people that are a Torah, Torah in it, Torah inclined, to make them Torah scholars, to make them maybe rabbis, or to make them people that are going to live a Torah lifestyle. In Slabatka, the, the objective was to create the future leaders of the Jewish people. And the altar worked tirelessly to get talented, young prodigies from all over Europe to come to Slabatka. And he actually had scouts in every little region in Europe to try to find the best and brightest young minds of the nation and to do everything that he they could to get them to come to Slabatka. And once they were there, he would dedicate everything. He, he had superlative dedication to make that uh, student into a Torah giant. He once mentioned that the entire goal of the Slabatka Yeshiva was to produce Rabbi Aaron Cutler. That's the whole goal. Rabbi Aaron Cutler, of course, he went on to found the great yeshiva in Lakewood, the biggest yeshiva in America, the second largest yeshiva in the world, was founded in 1943 in Lakewood, New Jersey. Today, there's almost 10,000 students there. That was founded by the student of the altar, Rabbi Aaron Cutler. Says the altar, the entire goal of the yeshiva, founding it, everything is about producing one Rabbi Aaron Cutler, because Rabbi Aaron Cutler is going to bring Torah to the whole world. So they said to him, wait a minute. If you want to have one Rabbi Aaron Cutler, why do you need to have 400 students in your yeshiva? So he responded, well, yes, the objective is Rabbi Aaron Cutler, but he needs a yeshiva with 400 students. But this shows his attitude. His attitude was not to create foot soldiers, but to create generals, giants. And once the student was there, he would never give up on them, even when others considered the situation hopeless. And his dedication to his students was far beyond anything that we are familiar with. Uh, for example, I don't know if there's anyone in the world who does this anymore, but he would observe fast days. He would fast Traditionally, when it, when you want to, when you really want to pray fervently, you could adopt a voluntary fast day, a whole day of fasting to achieve your goal. He would fast endlessly and pray endlessly that his students would succeed. In later years, his feet became chronically injured because he would have these extended hours of prayer over his students' well-being. When the altar met Rabbi Chil Yaakov Weinberg, who was a prize student, but someone that the altar was fearful that he would lose to some other cause. So years later after Rabbi Weinberg left the yeshiva, the altar met him and saw him praying with devotion. And he said to him, my prayers must have worked. I fasted 40 days that he should not deviate from the pop proper path. Could you imagine a teacher who's fasting for 40 days that their student should be successful? And he adopted a very hands-on approach 
uh, a story that um, a very powerful story about Rav Yaakov Yitzchak Ruderman, who was the future founder of Shiva of the one of the largest and pre- most prestigious yeshivas in America, the Ner Yisrael Yeshiva in Baltimore. So he came to Slabatka as a 14-year-old prodigy, son of a rabbi. And in Rosh, Rosh Hashanah, he made a resolution to finish the entire Babylonian Talmud over the course of the next six months until Pesach. But sadly, a week after Sukkot, which is two weeks after Rosh Hashanah, the word reached the altar that Rav Rudiman's father had tragically passed away in his town. So what to do? Do you tell the young student that his father died, but he just now committed to finish almost 3,000 pages of Talmud in six months? So the altar decided to withhold the information from the boy until Pesach because he was fearful that his concentration and his diligence will suffer and he won't be able to complete his pledge. So his students asked him, wait a minute, doesn't this boy need to say Kaddish? Right? The, the, the orphan says Kaddish for the father. Alta says, you know what? Yes, but finishing Talmud is a much greater merit for the deceased than his son reciting Kaddish, Kaddish for him. I think it's also instructive to learn about all aspects of the educational philosophy and approach of the altar. You know, I think, you know, when you, when, when there's a question or a dilemma about which method, which approach to use, you find the person that's the most successful in doing it and you say, okay, what did he do? What did he do right? And what can we learn from it? Unquestionably, the altar of Slabatka, Rabbi Nassim Sifinto of Slabatka, was the best at producing Torah giants. So there's this whole area of of the yeshiva that he was very unique about. He had very strict rules about being clean, about being neat, of having nice clothing. He said a yeshiva student must look like a prince, not a shlamazel. He did not allow his students to grow beards, for example. And you see the pictures of the students on Slabatka. They have nice, stylish clothing. They have perfectly clean shaven, a, a tilted fedora, perfectly perched at the right angle. Some slick or coiffed manicured here. And all that is a product of a, an attitude that the altar instituted in Slabatka. And that is, if you're a yeshiva student... If you are part of the legion of Hashem, so to speak, you have to look like a prince. There was one student that he was slouched. The altar insisted that yeshiva students should stand straight, have good posture, and don't be stooped. So the altar tried everything he could to get this particular student to stand straight. But nothing worked. So the altar ordered him to wear pince these eyeglasses that clip onto the nose but don't have earpieces, not very common today, but that would force him to stand straight because if he didn't, the glasses will topple over. Uh, if someone in the yeshiva had a button fall off his shirt or jacket, they weren't allowed into the yeshiva until it was fixed. In the early days of the yeshiva, they actually had, I found this anecdote really interesting, they had an in-house tailor to make sure that the student's clothing was perfect. The altar would say, if you have a hole in your sleeve, that symbolizes that you have a hole in your head. If you have a creased hat or a creased jacket, it shows you have a confused mind. And I, I think we could surmise that you know the stature of the yeshiva student at the time was very low. They were the lowest rung of the totem pole. And he invested heavily about raising the stature of the yeshiva student, to give them pride, to give them the swagger, the bravado to know that they are 
the creme de la creme. They don't, they don't need to look elsewhere to find fulfillment and meaning. And the author's dedication to his students in all areas of life was mind-boggling. Uh, if there was a student who was sick, he would arrange for medical treatment. If a student was involved in matchmaking, he would investigate the prospective spouse on his behalf and he would see to it that the monetary needs of the engagement and marriage are met. If a student would pursue a rabbinic post, he would investigate the community and the opportunity to see if it was suitable. If a student had to deal with being drafted into the army, the altar would not rest until he was released. His students testified that the altar loved them more than he loved his own children. And he really cared for every aspect of their well-being and their growth. But above all, he was on top of the spiritual progress of his students. He knew them inside out and was always monitoring them. And he saw everything. He paid attention to everything that the student did, even the most minor actions, how they walked, how the words they used. And he would always keep in his head a progress report of each one of his students. And the students were encouraged to come speak to him. And if the student wouldn't come, he would visit them and find out how they're doing. I want to read two quotes from a comprehensive book about the yeshiva world of the time uh, called Mating of a Gadol about the altar's interactions with his students. Quote, Rabbi Nassim Sifinkel was totally dedicated to his students. He would begin his private talks with them at 10 a.m. and finish at midnight. If the late guest happened to be afraid to go to his lodgings alone, the altar would escort him. The student was always treated respectfully and never made to feel that he was being ordered to act one way or the other. He was gently guided to reach the conclusion that the altar's way was the correct and the best way for him. The most forceful mode of commanding a student was for the altar to tell him, quote, this is how things are done in the yeshiva. The altar evaluated each of his talmidim, each one of his students, and decided which of a surprising variety of techniques would yield the best result. This student would progress only through receiving honors. The other needed to be castigated. The third would best be motivated when encouraged by praise. And the fourth must be handled with kid gloves. Sometimes a student would be made to feel worthless and be driven away. But even in the cases, even in the cases where this action was not merely an educational ploy, the altar would never expel a student outright. The altar paid special attention to every detail of a student's action, how he walked, how he stood, how he sat, every word, every utterance, Every blink of the eye and crimp of the lips passed under his scrutiny. And there was nothing of insignificance in the student's actions. And at every audience, the student underwent a fresh examination. In Rabbi Finkel's view, a man was never static, but a creature who exercised free choice and change. It was wondrous how Rabbi Finkel sensed the student's every minor drift towards either progress or decline. He was prone to suddenly change his opinion about a student before others had noticed a hint of transformation in him. But whatever his verdict about a person, it was never arrived at through generalizations. He took into account all the aspects he was able to discern at play within an individual's personality and no one would ever be seen as totally black and white. He noted the good qualities among the person's bad and vice versa. Thus, no man was negated by him. He, and this is me talking, I'll finish the quote, the first quote. He was someone who had an otherworldly sense of human character and human psychology. And he just knew what to do. And, and he was able to monitor a, a astonishing, staggering amount of students to keep track of each one of them, where they're holding, and to notice every slight change in their slope 
of their progress. Just fascinating. His next quote is a quote from his prime disciple, Rabbi Avraham Grzynski. Incidentally, as I mentioned in part one of this podcast, my great-grandfather, he describes glowingly, this is a quote, the changes he witnessed in the characters of those who sat around the altar. A great innovation was seen in the altar's base medrash, in, the, in his yeshiva. This innovation was not only in his great ascent, but also in the ascent of the pupils who sat around him. The novelty was that the progress noticeable in each one went far beyond what was proportionate to his efforts. It was wondrous to see that those who did not apply themselves to improving their character traits made made great advances over time, while those who toiled in suppressing traits and correcting them made extraordinary advances. In a short time, magnificent changes in the characteristics of those of these students were, were to be seen, from idleness to assiduousness, from stinginess to benevolence, from dismay to judiciousness and deliberation, from a life of frivolity and laughter to a life of content and earnestness. And then he ends off here where the Chafetz Chaim said about Rafinkel, comparing and contrasting what he did with students to what the altar did, the Chafetz Chaim said, I author books, and he forms people. To me, this is, it's so interesting uh, of someone who had such a deep understanding of people and how they change and how to best orchestrate that they change positively that his prime student writes that the situation was set up in a way that people by default became better people. Just being in the environment with the altar and in the environment of the Slabat Yeshiva, in the Musur Yeshiva, they changed and became greater people. Now, in 1924, there was a decree from the Lithuanian government to mandate secular studies in the yeshiva. It was only 32 years previously where Volazhin, the flagship yeshiva of the Jewish people, closed over this issue with the Russian government. Now, the new Lithuanian government, it only existed for a few years after World War I, they abruptly, they have this mandate that all yeshivas have to teach secular studies. So what to do about it? So the, the altar decided to establish the first modern yeshiva in Israel. It's not so clear if he intended to move the entire yeshiva from Slabatka, from Lithuania, to Hebron, to Israel, or just to open a branch there. But regardless, in 1924, he handpicked students to go. He sent Rabbi Avram Grzynski, the Manal Ruchani, to set up the yeshiva while he remained in Slabatka. In 1926, they swapped places. Rabbi Avram Grzynski returned to the helm of Slabatka. And the altar, he made aliyah. And he moved to Hebron. And he remained there for two years before his passing in 1928. The Rosh Yeshiva, Rabbi Moshe Mordechai Epstein, he suggested that this decree out of the blue from the Lithuanian government to mandate secular studies was actually a fortuitous one from heaven to get Torah spread all over the globe, to, to be that impetus that's going to, that pushed Slabatka to open up a branch in Israel. And it's interesting, perhaps uh, there is some credence to that, because almost immediately after the yeshiva was established in Hebron, the government abolished the decree and things resumed as they were prior. And it's actually interesting in hindsight, looking back with you know almost 100 years of time since the altar, we kind of see several examples of a theme that we see throughout Jewish history. You know, the, the, the difference, of, one of the differences between our perspective of God and other nations and other religions is that we believe that the Almighty interferes and orchestrates history. And that's why 
in Deuteronomy, for example, is actually a mitzvah to talk, to look backwards because we can actually learn about God through history. So in hindsight, we could suggest that the altar played vital roles to ensure that yeshivos have continuity and thus Torah is not forgotten. Think about it. The altar establishes the yeshiva in Slabatka in 1882 at a time where Valajin is at its absolute peak. No one could have known that it was only 10 years later and Valajin would shutter its doors. In 1892, Valajna is closed. But by that time, Slabatka was already established and ready to take over the mantle of being the flagship yeshiva of the Jewish people. Now fast forward to 40 years later, you know, the altar is establishing Torah all over Europe. And overnight, he decides to open yeshiva in the wasteland of British Mandate Palestine. But now we could see that this too was an example of the Almighty preparing the remedy before the illness. It's going to be only 15 years later. And all the yeshivas of Europe, or almost all the yeshivas of of Europe, are going to be disbanded or decimated. But what do you have? The next epicenter of Torah already has a burgeoning yeshiva flourishing in Israel. Uh, An end note on that yeshiva in 1929, in one of the most horrific and macabre episodes of the 20th century, 24 students of the Hebron yeshiva were murdered in cold blood by rioting Arabs in what is called the Hebron Massacre. They killed all told throughout the city of Hebron. I think it was 67 Jews. They were upset about something or the other and they just went on a rampage and were just slashing and killing people left, right, and center. And this yeshiva in Hebron, this branch of the Slabat yeshiva in Hebron was moved from Hebron to Jerusalem and where it still exists today It's one of the biggest yeshivos in Israel. Thousands of students, one of the most prestigious yeshivos out there. And the yeshiva in Slabatka, which continued under the auspices of the altar's students, that sadly ended in uh, over during the Holocaust, but it was reestablished in Israel as well in I think 1947 or 1948. So today in Israel, there's two massive yeshivos, one of them called Yeshivas Slabatka, Knesset Israel, in Bnei Brak, the city of Bnei Brak, and one of them called Yeshivas Chevron, Knesset Israel, in Jerusalem. Both of them are the handiwork of the altar of Slabatka, Rabbi Nassan Tzvi Finkel. Looking back at his legacy, he orchestrated a revolution. He made the yeshiva into what it is. He brought the yeshiva movement to its greatest potential. It's not just a place where people come to study Torah. It's a place where education of the students is the primary goal. He took Musser, character development, and brought it into the yeshiva to be there alongside the Talmud study. And he succeeded in personally molding almost all of the giants that emerged from the yeshiva world, either by him directly or via his students that continued his way. A week after he passed, his student, Rabbi Yerucham Levavitz, who was the mashkiach in the Mir Yeshiva, he said, Quote, a man who sat his whole long life in a single cubicle from which the light of the entire world to the entire world emanated. How great were his deeds. This we can say with certainty that if not for him, God forbid Torah would have been forgotten from Israel. 
we see, continues Rabbi Rucham, that those yeshivos which he did not establish have many locks hanging on the doors, but the yeshivos which he built, they stand firm and strong. Another eulogy of Ramnasan Sifinkel was that, quote, only this man, Ramnasan Sifinkel, was privileged by heaven to create almost all the Torah centers in Lithuania and to salvage the rescued remnant, the She'eris HaPleta of the Jewish people. We cannot imagine what form the Jewish people might have taken were it not for this messenger from above. And what the fate of our holy Torah might have been in this time had he not restored the crown to its glory. Rabaran Cutler, he stated that the altar was the teacher of all the Jewish people. Rabbi Yaakov Kamenetsky, another one of his students, he said that the altar was the greatest builder of Torah in the last hundred years. And if you actually look at all the yeshivas in America and almost all the yeshivas in Israel, they're all directly linked to the altar of Slavarga, to Rabbi Nassim Tzvi Finkel. Rabbi Yaakov Yitzchak Rudiman, who established the yeshiva in Baltimore, in Ner Yisrael, he said that the entire existence of Torah leadership in the world is accredited to the altar. Just a remarkable individual, a remarkable figure, and really a remarkable story. And a story I think that's worthy for us to think about. The fact that what would our world today look like if we didn't have Musr, we didn't have a Musr Yeshivos, and we didn't have the altar to, to create a revolution. Today, there is hundreds upon hundreds of Yeshivos. There's more Yeshivos today than there maybe ever were. And there's more students maybe than there ever were. And that is a historical anomaly. In many times in history, the, the yeshiva was it, it was, it was scattered, it was small, it wasn't on this huge scale. And today, thanks largely to the altar and his students and his children and his descendants, uh, yeshivos are ubiquitous and yeshivos are dominant. But I think it's a remarkable story that really our Jewish world today is really crafted by this individual and this story. Again, part two of the Altar of Slobodka podcast was sponsored by Josh Blackman in honor of his parents, Iris Hershenson and Jamie Blackman. If you would like to sponsor a history podcast, uh, you could do it in the merit of the recovery of someone, in the loving memory of a departed one in honor of your spouse or your coworkers or your friends or anonymously, if you want to support spreading Torah and spreading the story of the Jewish of the Jewish people to the whole world, you can always email me, RabbiWalby at gmail.com. You could also email me about other things. I do respond to every email that I get. I look forward to next time.